I'm Gwendolyn Hustved, and I want to talk to you about the international perspective on family and consumer sciences. So I'm a home economist. Home economics is what family and consumer sciences is called everywhere except the United States. I'm sure that you can look into why that is uh, as part of a separate topic, but it's important to know when you meet somebody internationally and want to explain um, what you're uh, studying or what you're working on or what your um, professional area is part of, calling it home economics is totally fine everywhere in the world. Um, uh, even in the United States, uh, because people in the rest of the world, in many cases, um, uh, understand and respect home economics as a discipline. One of the things that makes me proud to say that I am a home economist is that home economics is the original sustainability discipline. Our founder in the United States, Ellen Swallows Richards, was actually an environmental uh, scientist who uh, really cared about the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the health of families. So she completed the uh, mapping of the water table in Massachusetts, for example, because knowing where wells were vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, factories that were creating pollution had an impact on families. Uh, but of course, she also really cared about um, having women have access to higher education in order to use science to protect the health of their families, to improve quality of life. And in fact, Ellen Swallows Richards is responsible for coining the word ecology into the English language. It was a German word. She was looking for a way to describe that there was this system that uh, impacted other parts of the system and that we all lived inside of. Um, and that's why in some cases people talk about human ecology as an alternate name for home economics. Uh, I became a home economist uh, because while I trained as a chemist, uh, in some ways similar to Ellen Swallows Richards, I was really interested in using my knowledge to help people directly. Um, uh, yes, it's great to make discoveries, but I wanted to actually impact people's lives. I wanted to see the faces of the people whose lives I was changing. And for that reason, I trained to become a home economist. Uh, now. I am really proud of the discipline of home economics. Um, here in the US, sometimes we uh, we use denigrating terms related to home economics. Um, I always push back right away um, uh, uh, with people, letting them know that using a denigrating term related to home economics or like an attitude you know, about home economics suggests uh, potentially some misogyny um, uh, in, in, in the uh, thought behind that. Um, and uh, sexism, and that um, they may not be appropriately valuing uh, the lives that people live at home, which may be the result of uh, the pressures of capitalism in our fast-paced world. Um, so if uh, uh, people say, well, you know, home economics, isn't that just about making women homemakers? First thing I would say is it's about making everybody, giving everybody the capability to make homes that they're happy in, that are healthy, and that they're proud of, not just women, right? Boys are definitely included. And uh, that the other aspect of this is that uh, uh, it's uh, important for us to value homes, right? Uh, homes are where everything happens. What's wrong with valuing homes? So making homes is uh, something that some people do as their full-time occupation, the thing that keeps them occupied. Even if they're not paid for, it, it's valuable. And uh, so no apologies there. Home economics helps people make homes. But also, home economics helps people who are really good at making homes actually make money doing the things that they do at home, right? So it helps them professionalize to say, hey, I'm really good at this food thing. Maybe I should get a degree and be a, diet a dietitian, right? Or maybe uh, I'm really good at this, uh, um, you know, uh, home planning thing. Maybe I should get a degree and become a licensed interior designer. So it's actually a, a pathway for people whose uh, work may not be valued in the marketplace to um, gain professionalization. So for that, we can also be incredibly proud. Uh, we value homes and we've helped people take what's valuable in the home and take it into the marketplace. I also am really proud of home economics because I've had an opportunity to see what home economics does around the world. 
When I first came to Texas State in 2008, Maria Cannibal, the then director, uh, introduced me to uh, the International Federation for Home Economics at my first AAFCS, American Association of Family Consumer Sciences, meeting. Uh, I wasn't really jiving. I was like, hmm, I don't know where I fit in here. And she said, Gwendolyn, I know exactly where you fit in. Let me introduce you to the IFHE ladies. And they were right. I'm a home economist because I really care about helping people, but I also care about having an impact in the world. Um, and uh, International Federation for Home Economics helped me meet people from around the world who care about those exact same things. So the International Federation for Home Economics was founded in 1908 in Lucerne, Switzerland. People traveled from all over the world to this original founding meeting. And over the past more than 100 years, uh, we have been uh, working as a, a federation on um, establishing and supporting the discipline of home economics all around the world. The United States is a member of uh, the International Federation for Home Economics through the uh, organization IFHE US. You can join IFHE US by going to ifheus.org and uh, joining IFHE US makes you a member of the International Federation for Home Economics, just like me. Uh, only you might get a student rate, so if you're a student. Uh, we are really excited about the uh, IFHE World Congress. Uh, this is something that's held almost every four years. We had about a 10 year gap during World War II. Uh, started in 2008 in Switzerland, so it's the Congress of all the people uh, who were interested in home economics in Switzerland. I've attended uh, the one in 2008 in Switzerland for the 100th anniversary. I went to the one in Australia in 2012 in Melbourne. That was really cool. And uh, who knew? Home economics is all over Australia. They are also in dire need of home economics teachers, so family and consumer science teacher cert people interested in an international working or professional experience. Australia may be the place for you. Uh, Ireland is another country that has home economics that you might discover you really enjoy working in. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, I attended the World Congress in South Korea. Now, the World Congress in 2020 uh, is was supposed to be in Atlanta. I'm adding this little update to this presentation because although it's the second time that the World Congress will be held in the United States, we've actually had to postpone the Congress until 2022 because of the global, uh, global COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, um, this uh, meeting uh, that will be in 2022 is an important meeting for uh, gathering all of the latest research and for meeting together as home economists and talking about important home economics activities. Um, I also really care about International Federation for Home Economics because I happen to be the current president of the International Federation for Home Economics. Yep president of the world. Uh, this uh, is a, an important responsibility that I'm very honored and excited to have uh, because I am the youngest president uh, that the International Federation for Home Economics has, has had. Uh, and um, so I, I'm really excited to play my part in a generational transition uh, for home economics in its second century. So uh, if you go to ifhe.org, you can learn a lot more about it. Uh, I've made great friends uh, in IFHE from around the world, uh, people who I talk to and meet with on a professional basis, but also on a personal basis. If I'm visiting places like England, I can look people up, stay at their houses, uh, visit uh, local um, uh, uh, home economics related things, uh, often um, things like uh, cooking, shopping, and that sort of thing. And uh, it's been uh, wonderful for me to be able to talk to people around the world and feel part of a global community. You can too. So now that I've introduced that I'm a home economist and that home economics is an international discipline that's represented by uh, international federation, I wanna to talk to you really specifically about what home economics can mean in a global setting. So as a home economist, as part of the International Federation for Home Economics, I got involved in a program committee that focused on sustainable household technology. Now, here at Texas State, if you're a Texas State student that's watching this, but at many universities uh, in the United States, you'll think of home economics as being represented by, um, you know, four or five majors. But in fact, there are many areas of home economics, sub-disciplines, that don't 
currently have their own majors, such as housing or household technology, that are still really important areas of research and professional activity for home economists. I have friends who got master's degrees in textiles and went on to work in household technology for companies like Maytag, helping them design new washers and dryers. Um, we call them washers, you may call them washers, that's up to you. Uh, so uh, the uh, Global Alliance for um, uh, Developing Clean Household Technology is something that I want to talk to you about uh, just a little bit. So why household technology? Um, of course, the 20th century was uh, all about technology. The changes were huge, right? Uh, we went from having no refrigeration at the beginning of the 20th century to having um, personal refrigeration uh, at the end of the 20th century. Um, uh, air conditioning, um, uh, on-demand hot water heaters, uh, uh, dishwashers uh, that are actually very sustainable, much more sustainable than washing by hand. I have a friend who actually did his dissertation just watching people wash the dishes. Some economics for you. Uh, so uh, this technology change um, is something that we in the United States uh, totally enjoy, right? Hey, Alexa, play me an episode of Friends, right? But um, the fact is, is that not everybody in the world um, shares in this boom of household technology. And we have to think about uh, how uh, home economics can help um, provide people the good that household technology represents without some of the downsides, including um, uh, wasted electricity in many cases. Uh, 2012 was the year of sustainable energy for all, which is why I found some of these uh, statistics. Uh, so the UN in 2012 found that 20% of the world doesn't have electricity and 40% uh, of the world doesn't have access to clean cooking facilities. And by clean, we mean something that literally isn't covered with soot and dirt and filled with smoke that can cause important health impacts. So we don't think of our stove as being an amazing technology, but for a lot of people in the world, wow, that would be great. Now, the UN predicts that the demand for electricity will increase by 36% by 2035. Uh, the number of people without electricity and cooking facilities will remain virtually unchanged. So who's using all this electricity if it's not people that are finally getting to <laughs> cook with clean technology, right? Whose houses are still filled with smoke and who are having lung damage from um, uh, cooking with uh, less than clean facilities. Well, it's just the rest of us who have all a bunch of devices and doodads, right? Um, and uh, so uh, we don't have the sustainable balance. Um, making sure that everyone in the world has access to electricity uh, or um, some type of energy that can be used to um, give them uh, lives that meet a basic minimum level is um, something that's important. But we want to make sure that we do that without increasing uh, emissions that could uh, damage the climate. So as home economists, we have to think about that. Like that's part of our job. Kind of cool, right? So uh, making sure that families that are accessing electricity for the first time can do so in a way that uh, supports their needs, that's only fair, right, to, to have access to all of this amazing technology, um, but also um, uh, ensures that it's done in a climate change friendly way, that's a challenge for us. Uh, so uh, baseline, we would like to make sure that families have access to clean cooking facilities so that they can stop burning things like wood and dung and grass, uh, all of which can uh, uh, emit soot um, that damages the lungs uh, and um, can be you know, uh, just as harmful to uh, the environment as uh, not as a car, but as any other type of carbon uh, burning would be. Um, so uh, that's our challenge. Now, when we think about the first uh, activities that a family that's gained access to electricity will do, um, there's a threshold that uh, international planners assume, which is enough electricity, uh, so about 250 kilowatts hours per year, to power two compact fluorescent light bulbs for five hours a day, so basically from, from dusk until sleeping time, uh, to charge a mobile phone, and to power a floor fan. Um, and the floor fan will um, uh, help to remove uh, dirty air from the home. 
And of course, uh, having clean air in the home has been a concern of home economics from its original founding. Uh, so we're very, very interested in preventing air pollution within the home. Uh, clean cooking, however, in a home would not be uh, done with electricity. Clean cooking would be done with improved cooking stoves that use uh, less fuel, uh, so it reduces their carbon emission and also prevents the um, soot and smoke from entering the house, right? So it's helping to channel it elsewhere. Um, obviously, once you get access to electricity, most families will eventually have greater demands, maybe a video game player or a television um, or a, a laptop to charge a computer um, for students, for example, but these are the initial assumptions. Think about how you use electricity and imagine what your life would be like if this was the amount of electricity that you were happy to use. Now, one of the things that we uh, have to think about is that uh, the way that electrification was done in the United States during the 20th century, uh, involving um, poles and cables um, and, uh, in many cases, uh, dams or coal-fired plants, isn't appropriate for uh, the 21st century when we have access to new technologies, including solar and wind energy and vastly improved batteries for storing energy. For that reason, uh, many people are thinking of microgrids or even off-grid as an appropriate way to electrify communities that currently don't have electricity. So imagine if instead of building one big dam uh, that would uh, potentially destroy a whole community, the legends of the sunken village under the dam, uh, destroy a whole community that was enjoying that valley before in order to provide electricity to all of the neighboring communities via cables that have to be strung and maintained. What if instead it was a matter of providing the solar panels and the batteries for each of the homes within that one little valley that otherwise would have been destroyed and then the next community that would have received electricity in the same way. Um, providing work opportunities for people to uh, install and maintain the electrification just like uh, a big dam would um, without the construction costs and the attendant environmental impact. So uh, it's kind of exciting to think about how we could change um, our approach to electrification and of course home economists are in there helping families who have received electri electrification make household technology decisions. Uh, so if we think about it right now, people who are using an electrical grid, isn't this cool? Like, you know, we think of um, uh, just our little major, like interior design or, or fashion, and we don't think about how we're part of this much larger ecosystem, right? People buy clothes, they do laundry, the laundry may require electrification. It's important for us to understand that whole ecosystem. So currently, many people who are on an electrical grid, um, their electricity is provided about 63% with the burning of fossil fuels, 3% with nuclear, 14% with hydro that I just mentioned. Wind is gaining 5%, solar 5%, uh, 1%. This was in 2011. These numbers have changed even since this was published. But if we set up families with um, mini grids, right, uh, in places where they currently don't have electricity, uh, we completely eliminate the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, we might have biomass, so 21% of biomass, that would be things like wood, dung, um, agricultural waste, right? Um, and, uh, but then we can see that wind is an important part of the off-grid portfolio. Uh, diesel does burn the fossil fuels, but even when we add the 7% to the 21%, these are things that are emitting carbon, we can see it's much, much less than the 63% of the on-grid system. So, sustainability uh, benefits and also um, power and control for families who can um, uh, rent to own the electrical equipment that powers their home and have it be part of the value of their home forever as opposed to just a bill that comes in the mail for the rest of your life, which is what we have in the United States. All right, uh, so that's a whole story about uh, uh, household technology and how as an international home economist, I get to think about really cool things uh, related to international development. But I wanna talk about a really important philosophical aspect to this. Um, typically we think of the developed world as developing the technology and then giving it like a gift to people in the developing world. But actually, that's probably an unhealthy paradigm. The fact is, is that 
probably some of the best sustainable technology innovations are going to come from the people who really need it, right? Uh, so, you know, we are developing some pretty unsustainable technology. We're pretty much the only place in the world that uses a heated box to dry our clothes. When sunshine uh, right, is outside, uh, the UV disinfects textiles just as well um, and is totally free, uh, doesn't have carbon emissions at all, and makes the clothes smell great without the addition of perfumes and other allergens, right? So um, in the name of convenience and also um, in the name of consuming energy, uh, to replace uh, time that uh, we are just too busy to provide, um, we've made a choice. Uh, but in other parts of the world, they don't want to make that choice. They haven't made that choice. They won't make that choice. They'll come up with other better ways to do things, and we should be paying attention to that. So home economics can actually serve as a two-way street, allowing people in the developing world to share their innovations with people in the developed world as well. Uh, of course, when you buy household technology, it's a big investment. Um, so one part of making technology sustainable is to come up with ways to make it less expensive, right? Um, so uh, there's, and we also have to educate people about the trade-off. My uh, high efficiency washing machine uses way less water, which is really important here in Texas with so many people consuming water. We don't have a drought because we don't have water. We have a drought because we have thousands of people moving here every day, right? Drinking the water, washing their clothes in the water. So yes, that washing machine was more expensive, but in the long term, I got the money back by having lower water bills. So that's something else that home, econ home economists can help families understand. It's important to have the technology be accessible price-wise, but sometimes a more expensive technology is worth it. Uh, of course, I just mentioned uh, that we, as some, uh, I'm certainly a high, upper middle class family now, um, uh, and so I could sacrifice uh, convenience and comfort, but I don't. I don't own a dryer because I believe they're wrong, and uh, we have a clothesline outside because it's an uh, inexpensive way to do things. Um, so uh, that's one role that home economists can play, is helping families think through um, the cost benefit uh, not just of economics, but also of quality of life and sustainability for their um, household technology decisions. Um, now, I have some additional uh, parts of this video that I'm going to keep going, but for some of you, this may be where you stop. Um, but uh, for the rest of you, please keep going with me to think about um, product development, right? If, as home economists, we can help um, make better products. Now, one of the challenges with product development models that think of product development as an activity that happens between business people and scientists is that it leaves out uh, some of these ecosystem concerns that we as home economists can address. So I'll give you an example. Uh, people have said that people wouldn't pay for energy efficient dryers. Uh, we don't have any rules related to energy efficiency in dryers and uh, they're, they're we don't label dryers with the with the um, energy saver because it's just not something that's being produced. And part of the reason in the U.S. is because uh, appliance manufacturers did focus group studies and found when they asked people, what do you want? Do you want your clothes to be dried quicker uh, or do you want them to save the environment? People said, no, we want them to dry quicker. And of course, when you pr provide people with this um, uh, stark choice, uh, people will always choose, oh yeah, quicker drying, like that sounds better. But uh, I found evidence in Department of Energy studies that uh, when they modified a dryer so that it actually stopped using electricity when the stress on the grid was higher, so the dryer kept tumbling, but it wasn't heating anymore, which means the clothes were just not getting wrinkles, they were just bouncing around inside the drum, but they weren't being dry. Uh, and then when the um, electricity, when the stress on the grid was reduced, right, um, you notice the lights flicker sometimes, so when the stress on the grid was reduced, the dryer started heating again and the clothes were dry. In this case, it took longer for the clothes to dry. So the DOE made some dryers like this, they put them in people's homes, and later they asked the people, was that feature an inconvenience? And everybody said, what are you talking about? Nobody noticed that the dryer was saving ele uh, electricity. Nobody noticed that the dryer was helping reduce stress on the grid, potentially preventing brownouts and blackouts, right? 
So the manufacturer had said, oh no, uh, quickest time, that's the most important thing. But when they put in a feature that helped the environment and helped provide electricity to everyone um, consistently, consumers didn't even notice that it was taking maybe 10 minutes longer than normal. So I would say that sometimes uh, a different perspective is needed than just asking people in a marketing focus group what they want. Who's not going to say they want it to be faster, better, sexier, and cooler, right? Like nobody's going to say they don't want that. But if you test the reality, sometimes people will uh, accept something that has uh, a spectrum of benefits. Um, so, you know, ultimately, uh, in some cases, you take what people said on, on face value and try doing things a different way. I remember being at a, a International Federation for Home Economics meeting when, uh, um, um, oh, I'm going to forget her name. Um, it's not Hester. Hester's from South Africa. Martha. Martha from Mexico. She worked for, uh, worked for an appliance manufacturer called Mabe. And she was presenting her company's work on high efficiency washer that used less electricity and less water, but was a top loading one. And we were all just like, the Germans especially were like, how could this be, right? But she explained, right, obviously some proprietary technology, but showed us the evidence this top loading washing machine actually didn't waste a ton of water filling up a drum. And this was because a bad experience with leaking front-loading washers had made Mexican consumers resistant to uh, using this type of appliance. So this manufacturer that was making appliances to sell in Mexico said, we need to come up with a different way to do it. So they just accepted the constraint and solved the problem anyway. So uh, sometimes we need to make sure that we're listening to consumers trying to achieve our goals and meet their needs and in other cases we need to test if those are real needs or just you know the of course I want it to taste better who wouldn't uh, another really cool thing in product development is in looking or engaging with the developing world is um, this idea of frugal innovation um, India is a global leader they call it Jugad which uh, means the stopgap solution uh, and an example of this would be um, a situation where um, we have an earthquake, right, or another natural disaster that destroys the electrical grid. Uh, it's a huge problem. Suddenly, food everywhere is rotting. People are exposed to health risk from, um, uh, with, because of tainted meat and food safety concerns. Oh, no, what do we do? So companies like GE blew through millions of dollars trying to solve this problem, right? And uh, the locals came up with uh, solutions immediately. So uh, building tiny refrigerators that use um, basically the same fan is, that is in computers, right? So it can be powered with a battery. Um, it still has coolant and everything, but it's really small. And the point is that you can put um, a, a couple of days worth of meat inside this tiny refrigerator, keep it safe. You don't need to uh, uh, refrigerate everything. You just need to refrigerate what's required for food safety. Uh, in Pakistan, where they had this huge earthquake, they remembered an ancient technology that human beings had discovered, which is that evaporation uh, of um, water uh, can um, release energy, which creates cooling. We use that. It's called sweating. But it turns out that other surfaces like uh, terracotta or clay can sweat. So a terracotta pot that's filled with water, the water in the pot is cooler than the ambient temperature because the pot is actually sweating. It's evaporating water. So what they did is they got the potters to make a terracotta pot that had a big empty hole in the middle, the size of a small refrigerator. And then they just put a glass door on the front of it, right, or a little wooden door so you can close it. And the inside of this little box is cool. Another benefit is there's water around the outside, which is also cool. So a little spigot on the side. You have cold water and your meat is being kept fresh for up to three days. Uh, who wouldn't want that for your little cabin, right? And uh, all they need is help with marketing, not millions of dollars to, uh, and product development sessions to try and solve the problem. So just thinking back to uh, older ways of doing things and in a frugal way, can uh, be another lesson that we can learn um, as, home e as home economists um, by thinking of technology transfer as something that goes both ways.
So uh, here's some other examples. Uh, mobile phones uh, across Africa, they're using mobile phones to, uh, for example, predict the price of their crops so that uh, so they can get information about uh, what the crops are selling for in the market to let them know if it's worth it to pack everything up and actually take things to the market, right? Will they make enough money? Um, they can, uh, they're using their mobile phones to, as actually a form of currency, right? Um, so if they have a less than dependable banking system or their um, uh, bills are, are um, you know, uh, when I was visiting Ethiopia, I discovered part of the challenge is the bills are made from, um, our bills are made from cotton, right? Um, but their bills are made from wood, right? And so the bills themselves start to fall apart. Um, uh, but with the phone, it's just electronic, uh, so you, you're not wasting materials. Um, also, of course, the phone allows you to talk, to send texts, and can serve as a flashlight, right? So mobile phones are a, 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 a huge technology that uh, for families. Um, some other innovations include things like um, using the bottoms of... Um, of uh, one or two liter soda bottles uh, and putting them into the roof of a home as a skylight, right? Instead of just wasting them. Um, cool, huh? I mean, you know, it's the right shape and uh, it was freely available. Uh, so, you know, why um, recycle it and make a skylight when you already have one? I mentioned clean cooking earlier. I wanna talk about it a little bit more now. Um, about 3 million people in the world, sorry, 3 billion, got that wrong, billion, use biomass for cooking and warmth. Uh, so they burn um, wood, dung, peat, right, um, which will become a fossil fuel. Peat will eventually become coal, but it's now in a less efficient form. Um, and then, of course, charcoal, which is uh, uh, produced from wood, um, uh, but has been um, flash fired to uh, make it... Um, uh, burn even better um, to be a more intensive form. It's just pure carbon at that point. So people all around the world are using biomass, uh, but they're using it in open fires. Um, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why, right? Um, but let's focus on the effects just now. Uh, the burning biomass is uh, inefficient, unless, of course, your goal is to heat your home. But in many places in the world, it just makes the homes unbearably hot. Uh, if you if you uh, use biomass outside, which can be uh, you know isn't uncommon, you still have to deal with the the smoke, all right? And the um, if you're using the stove, you're inhaling the smoke, um, and uh, so estimate that um, a million women around the world are killed every year because of smoke inhalation related to cooking. Uh, the eventual effects, including lung disease, um, from that smoke inhalation. So the Global Alliance for the Clean Cook Stove, oh, two million premature deaths uh, if we add in children. Um, so the Global Alliance for the Clean Cook Stove uh, was developed in order to find ways in which to help communities develop their own clean cooking method. Because it turns out that just giving people stoves that don't work with their homes or their lifestyles or their cultures wasn't the solution, right? Coming in and saying, you know, we're the big, uh, you know, outsiders. We're here to solve your problem. Um, you know what? People are free to ignore outsiders who try to solve their problems. But empowering people with education and information and entrepreneurship support to solve their own problems, right? That can be great. Um, so solving the problem of clean, of clean cooking um, is something that uh, home economists can help with in order to create sustainability and improve health outcomes for families. So this alliance basically said, look, we don't know what the cook stove will look like. We know what the cook stove will do, right? And that your local innovation, your jugad is important to develop the cook stove that works for your community in your region. Uh, so it may be made of terracotta, it may be made of bricks, it may be made of metal, it may be made of an old barrel, it may be made of um, stones. Uh, the design uh, isn't important, it's the effect, right? Does it increase burning efficiency and does it remove the toxic uh, smoke and particles from the home uh, by reducing indoor air pollution? That's what matters. Uh, so another important part of the Global Alliance for the Clean Cook Stove is they saw that the women in many regions need to be empowered to make this decision. 
um, in many cases, technology adoption is something in a patriarchal society that's controlled by men. So um, finding ways to uh, make it appropriate, and of course we had this happen in the US, right? Where we said, wait a minute, what type of appliances to purchase for a home should be the responsibility of the user and home economists helped with this. Uh, can you imagine how irritating it would have been um, for uh, developing um, a healthy uh, uh, homes here in the US if uh, every time a family wanted to make a technology decision, uh, it had to be treated with the same import as buying a car, right? Um, so empowering women to be the consumers of household technology is really important. Um, also developing um, uh, strategies uh, for making it uh, uh, financially feasible. Um, in some cases, uh, communities uh, help with entrepreneurship education that allows women to design stoves and has financing to help them produce them. And then they end up becoming business people as well as solving an important sustainability problem. Uh, so uh, this means as home economists, uh, we are not the heroes. Right? We're not the ones solving the problem. We're there to empower people with education to solve their own problems. So we can set a standard. We can say we can test the design that you had to determine whether or not it actually um, meets the goals of reducing uh, indoor pollution and increasing efficiency. But it's not our job to say that uh, we develop the solution. It's your job as the users to develop the solution. And it's our job to be supporting uh, scientists and educators. So uh, having heard me talk about uh, home economics in an international concept, you may be thinking, wow, um, how can I uh, make my career as uh, someone who's getting a degree in uh, home economics related field, um, what can I do to have an impact? Um, I think that one of the things that you can do is to make sure that household technology, household technology is something that is um, included when you, uh, if you're a teacher, when you're teaching and learning. So if you are going to become a family consumer science teacher in a school here in Texas or elsewhere in the U.S., thinking about um, household technology, including some of the examples that I gave or find examples of your own with even more up-to-date references, um, make sure that that's included, uh, that we don't abdicate our responsibility for household technology just because we've gotten Americans' needs satisfied, um, that there's still a lot of innovation that home economists can do around the world, and that your students that you're teaching could be the ones that make these change. Uh, for those of you who are going to be working in other areas besides education, you want to think about um, uh, what uh, work you're doing, what impact that has on uh, the household. Think about um, the impact that uh, it will have on health or public health. That's so important right now during um, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? A lot of people are thinking about how um, uh, our lives at home are impacting our health. Uh, you want to think about the climate, right? And how um, uh, the household is impacting the climate. Um, the uh, engineering uh, implications, right? Has something been designed so that it's able to be used by the users? Um, literally, does it work the way that people need? Um, and uh, if you're somebody working in marketing, uh, right, think about the whole family and how they're going to be um, using uh, your product, right? Um, of course, I've talked about um, women's empowerment and gender uh, as something that's uh, important to consider. Um, remembering that uh, families of all varieties and types are supported by home economics, including families of one or one person in their three cats and dogs, um, but that uh, uh, we want to have everyone feel empowered to live their best life at home. So no matter what discipline you're in, there are ways that you can help um, internationally uh, to improve the lives of families around the world uh, through home economics. So I hope that I've inspired you a little bit to consider how home economics is an international discipline and how no matter what career you end up working in, you will be able to connect to people around the world through home economics. Super.